Welcome to an exclusive skill capped guide for BFA patch 8.3. Throughout the final season of BFA, we'll be releasing select guides from our site here on YouTube. If you're interested in seeing more new content like this every week, alongside our exclusive matchup review series in which we cover in detail exactly how to win the hardest and most popular matchups, head over to skillcap.com. Hello all, Joe Fernandez here, and I'll be taking you through the basis of an unholy DK in patch 8.3. This guide will cover the essential parts of starting up your unholy death knight ready for the arenas, as well as dive into the playstyles of an unholy death knight in twos and threes. Let's start things off with the talents, showing you your standard build looking like this for most games. Your staple talents that will probably never be changed in PvP consist of Bursting Swords, Asphyxiate, Soul Reaper, and Unholy Frenzy. That leaves us with some situational talents that you could take depending on the matchup. You could run Infected Claws against Destro Warlocks or Priests, as these targets can't kite you, so you get more value from Necrotic Strikes here. It could be strong against Double Melee as well, during Dark Transformation, making its cleave apply festering runes to the melee, thus increasing your damage. That being said though, this will depend on the uptime you have on the melee, as all will serve, it's better against classes that you don't have 100% uptime on. Wraithwalk can be used when you don't need Spell Eater. This is common against Warriors or Windwalkers in 2s, or against melee cleave setups without heavy magic damage. Wraithwalk can break roots or be used as a gap closer in order to stay on elusive targets that could be hard to stick to. It could also be used to kite away from danger in order to try and live. Pestilence will be a very niche talent against training Disc Priests or Holy Paladins in 2v2. It won't really have use elsewhere and could depend on the partner they play with, as Epidemic is too good to pass on, as it's an excellent tool for keeping healers in combat. It has a chance to give a bit more damage in these scenarios when on top of Holy Paladins or Disc Priests in 2v2. Unholy Death Knights also have a wide range of great PvP talents that can be changed depending on you and your teammates' win conditions against your opponents. The main PvP talents will look something like this, using Necrotic Strike, Raise Abomination, and Necrotic Aura. Necrotic Strike is good for overall pressure against anything. It's the bread and butter of the spec as you'll be using this ability often. When stacked up, it could absorb a ton of direct healing or healing over time effects, making it difficult for healers to deal with this if under pressure. Raise Abomination is used for big pressure in the game. Stacking your Festering Runes allow you to get a lot of Necrotic Strikes off on your target. Sometimes the Abomination can be difficult to control, as it may not hit your main target or be easy to kite away. In this example, the Abomination only got to connect to the Druid now, just because Cervantes used his stun on the Druid to lock him in place. Saying that though, it will be a great choice, especially against Warriors, Priests or Warlocks. It will have an easy time connecting to these classes, allowing you to slaughter your foes. Be careful when against priests though, as they could use Shackle Undead on it, so you'll want to deny that if possible. Necrotic Aura will be a more situational talent, which gives you more magic damage pressure. This includes the damage of your Virulent Plague, Gushing Wood, and Breath of the Dying, which makes up a ton of your damage. It's easy to maintain, required you can keep up to your targets with ease. Necrotic Aura will also benefit your partner's magic damage as well, making it excellent when playing with a Demon Hunter or other magic DPS players. Other strong PvP talents that can be used depending on the situation will include Anti-Magic Zone, Dark Sim, Necromancer's Bargain, Lichborn, and Transfusion. Anti-Magic Zone can be used against any team that has one DPS spec with high spell damage, most notably against Mages, Assassination Rogues, Destro Warlocks, Rep Paladins, and Elemental Shamans. It's a great defensive cooldown for you and your teammates, used often during the offensive cooldowns of the enemy team in order to mitigate a lot of its pressure. You'll often see it traded out against the Destro's Dark Soul, a Mage's Combustion, or in this case, a Rogue's Vendetta. Although it requires your partner to stay in the perimeter of the zone, which should be fine in most situations. The only time where this can be unreliable is if the enemy team has a knock effect, like a Ring of Peace, which can nullify your AMZ. However, at least as the DK, you could save Death's Advance here, so you could stay in the AMZ and guarantee its safety net. Now, Dark Sim can be a fun PvP talent to run against spammable CC, mainly mages, locks, and sometimes druids, 
stealing their crowd control abilities and using it on the healers. You'll either steal these spells reliably, or even force the enemy casters to fake cast more, making it a win-win situation. You could also use it to steal defensive cooldowns, allowing you or your partners to live with more ease. When playing well with it and feeling confident, you could use it to steal instant abilities. For example, against Disc Priests, if you have big pressure on them in a stun, you could use it to copy Pain Suppression if you're sure they need to use it in order to survive. Necromancer's Barging applies Crypt Fever, and when a healer uses a direct heal, it will refresh the Crypt Fever. This can make a deal a good amount of extra pressure. It can also make it more reliable damage than Abomination against some comps. You could look to replace the Abomination or Necrotic Aura for this talent for more pressure. Lichborn should be used against teams that regularly stun you for pressure, such as Rogue Mage or against Elemental Shaman teams. It's also nice against Warlocks or Priests to get out of fears in order to bring more crowd control on yourself. Lastly, Transfusion could be taken against teams that train you with high damage, allowing you to have increased self-healing with your death strikes. It can be used if you are dying against a composition a lot and need the extra healing. This can be the case against DHDK compositions, as they can train you, as well as them not having mortal wounds, making your heals more potent. Moving on to the major essences, luckily here there are mainly only two that you'll need, being Conflict and Strife as well as Breath of the Dying. Conflict and Strife is used against teams that aim to kill you during stun windows that could be difficult to survive otherwise. It gives you extra versatility, making it easier to maintain the buff whilst it's in your major essence slot. It's used often too as you want to have extra PvP talents, which will be the case in a lot of matchups. Having access to Necrotic Strike from Conflict and Strife allows you to also use other strong PvP talents, which we discussed earlier. Breath of the Dying is a more aggressive choice, mainly taken in twos if you don't need the extra PvP talents in certain matchups, or simply want more ranged pressure. It could be nice against Warlocks, Mages or Survival Hunters, where you want the extra damage while struggling to get into their melee range. That leaves us with the Minor Essences, which are pretty set in stone. One slot will be automatically Conflict and Strife or Breath of the Dying, depending on which one you aren't using as a Major Essence, as they are both making for excellent Minor Essences. The other base I Minor will be Essence of the Focus in Iris, as Unholy DK scale well with Haste, and this will give you a ton of extra haste. Vision of Perfection will be your final slot, being good in all matchups, giving you a shorter cooldown on your apocalypse. This gives you more burst damage throughout the game. Moving on to your traits, the best major traits you'll want to play with are simple, being 3 Magus of the Dead, alongside 3 Festamites. These are simply the best for damage, especially in single target scenarios. If unable to get these, then Heart of Darkness can be a good alternative. Overwhelming Power is worth noting as it's a strong trait too, which would be ideal to have along with your other major traits. It gives you quite a chunk of extra haste, which will allow you to pile on the pressure more so than any other traits in its respective ring. If you are able to, with your defensive traits, you could look to have at least one Runic Barrier and one Cold Hearted as these are nice extra bonuses to your defense. However, you still want to prioritize the original major traits. As for other pieces of gear, every two-hand user has come accustomed in farming and using the Cut of Death Sword from King's Rest. It deals an incredible amount of damage, making it troublesome for most teams to deal with, especially when you have burst damage during its proc. There are also a ton of PvE trinkets available from the new raid, which can be a worthy time investment on heroic or mythic difficulty. The most powerful one is probably the Drestagath trinket. Drestagath is an overpowered trinket for burst pressure on single targets. You want to use it when you can ideally hit just one target, either during your offensive cooldowns or to finish off targets at low HP. Vita Charge Titan Shard is another strong trinket, giving you a ton of haste for yourself and a tiny bit of haste for your partners. It can be used in conjunction with your Drestagath or replace it in matchups where Drestagath won't be too beneficial and you want the Titan Shard for extra pressure. For a more defensive take, Psychic Shell can be nice against certain comps where you need to live, where you're being heavily pressured. Onto the last piece of the gearing stage, which may be the most vital, 
is the corruption on an unholy DK. This is vital as unholy DK is one of the specs that highly relies on gushing wounds pressure, making it your most favourable corruption to have. It gives you a crazy amount of extra damage, which you would otherwise lack, making unholy DK far more lacklustre and easy for most teams to deal with your pressure. If you don't have your hands on a gushing wound corruption piece, then you could use haste or versatility amplifiers as backup options until you can get the gushing wounds. Okay, so that covers everything around your build as an unholy DK. Now we can talk about the main playstyles you want to adopt for an unholy DK in 8.3. There are basically five main playstyles that you want to achieve in every arena game you have, with some of them varying more than others in terms of importance as well as how often to perform them. These five playstyles are the following. Keep up chains of ice and dots on your targets, utilize your disruption cooldowns, make offensive setups, surviving, and don't waste your defensive cooldowns. Chains of Ice is the most powerful, spammable snare in the game. It's super strong against any target, but specifically melee, being able to kite them with ease or force them off your partners whilst they have chains on them. This can result in enemy melee players losing a potential kill target. It will most definitely force them off the target they want to chase, unless they can exchange mobility cooldowns in order to reach them. Your dots give you your most reliable pressure, being able to dish out without being in melee range, so it's important to keep them up on your kill target and the enemy healer. Unholy DKs have access to a lot of interrupts, so you can rotate them well to deny a lot of casts. Pet Kick or Pet Stun, for instance, can be used whilst you're in crowd control to deny more casts. For example, Pet Interrupt if there is an lasso on yourself. Rotating them well means you can chain your disruption tools, allowing you to shut down more casts more often. Doing this well will make it much easier for your team to live, as well as you'll be stopping more devastating casts often. Death Grip can also be used as an interrupt, if you don't have access to other interrupts and you really want to stop a cast. Making offensive setups ties into this, as you want to save your offensive cooldowns during your disruption or crowd control on healers, so that you can create more pressure, which will result in forcing more defensive cooldowns. This can come from the help of your partners, helping you get CC chains on the healer, allowing you to pressure the DPS heavily with your offensive cooldowns. Then, you can follow up with your interrupts on the healer in order to seal the deal and close out the game. When playing with a Windwalker or a Demon Hunter, you want to try and do Death Grip into AoE stuns to create a ton of pressure. Fortunately, you can create these offensive setups yourself as well as an Unholy DK, using the tools that we discussed earlier. Cervantes does an excellent example of this, gripping the log out of line of sight on a greater hill, which nearly gets him the kill, but the priest saved his log with a Guardian Spirit. Surviving can evolve around quite a few yet simple things for an unholy DK. Chains of Ice can be powerful for kiting melee. Kiting like this will take less damage and avoid damage, so you will be able to survive for a long time. This is super useful against demon hunters and warriors, who would otherwise kill you as they will beat you toe to toe on pressure. Death's Advance can also be a nice tool used for surviving. Using it so you can't be snared and be immune to knock effects such as Ring of Peace can allow you to kite targets that are in a chains of ice with relative ease. Death Strike is another simple yet incredibly effective tool for living as an unholy DK. Make sure to use Death Strikes after you take big damage, as it's affected by the damage you take in the last 5 seconds, making it a reliable, big healing source against burst damage. Wasting AMS against casters or rogue mage can be your demise easily due to claw trinkets and heavy magic damage in general. Doing this often enough can lead to troublesome situations as we see Cervantes do here. Not only did AMS not get any real value against the Windwalker Destro, his healer has also used Cocoon on himself to survive. This means for the next minute, Cervantes could be in a lot of trouble and vulnerable to big magic damage, which may force a premature anti-magic zone. Further on this game though, we can now compare this AMS that gets forced. This was a good AMS as it was used during a long crowd control on his healer whilst he's low on health and is in a disarm which makes him unable to death strike. It results in him living quite comfortably and forces the enemy team to swap on the demon hunter. Your other defensive cooldowns will also apply to compositions where you can be a kill target as well. 
using them at the right time to survive, as well as not overlapping with your partners, will be the ideal to play and make it difficult for the enemy team to take you down. In general, you don't want to waste your defensive cooldowns against Rogue Mage, Jungle Cleave and Mage Log, as they can be the scary comps that can punish you if you use your AMS, AMZ or Icebound offensively. However, you can use these offensively if you think that you can get a kill or if it can benefit your team more so. That completes our 8.3 Unholy Death Knight guide. Feel free to leave any comments or questions down below. Hope you liked this video guide and thank you all for watching.